Hello and welcome to the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. I'm your host, Sandy Lowries, and the Good Girl Confessional Podcast is brought to us by WB40, Women Beyond 40 magazine. You can check out all the information at wb40.com. Welcome back to part two of our very special podcast with Stephanie Thompson, the author of the book, The Day My Vagina Broke, What They Don't Tell You About Childbirth. I will say that this uh, podcast talks a lot about lived experience of birth trauma and in Stephanie's case, um, about trauma that is irreparable. So please use your discretion before going forward listening to the podcast as some of the information might be distressing for some. Please welcome back to the podcast for part two, Stephanie Thompson. Elsie was just turning one and I said all right I'd never even wanted another baby like we were one and done that was enough one traumatic birth is enough in one person's lifetime however we never considered Elsie and when I went to pick her up that afternoon she was playing at my mum's house and I looked at her and I'm like hmm she might want a sibling let's (laughs) so I said to my husband so basically we gave ourselves three months we said by the end of this year if it's not done then we're going to move on, book in for that surgery and be be totally fulfilled. We were, we had all the love in the world we needed from her. It was enough. And then I was pregnant the month next month. <laughs> <laughs> so you go from five years to one month, you know. And one of the things I want to, want, to, want to ask you about is, and not to be too personal, but I think that while we're on this conversation, having a, a prolapse, whether it's a one, two, three or a four, um, and obviously it's different for everyone, but it also impacts your sex life and oh, yeah. your sense of self as a woman, your femininity, you know, your, our ownership of our vagina, if you like, um, totally. right, and our inner goddess, all the things. It makes us feel, I imagine, um, you know, for anyone who's going through it, I imagine that it, it, it really impacts all of that, which means it impacts on your relationship with your partner. Yes. Um, right? And I think that it's so fine to ask that because it's the number two question asked the most. Number one is how do you have another baby with prolapse? But number two is like how do you even fall pregnant? How do you have sex? Yeah, how do you have sex? And probably people more people. Carefully. Yeah. Probably (laughs) probably more people want to ask but they've got that, oh, you know, I don't want to go too far. I'm okay to answer it because I think it's valuable to know that it's never been the same. So I will say that without being, uh, you know, stepping on the privacy of my husband I respect his he's he's so supportive of me saying whatever I want about myself that's fine but to respect his privacy it's never been the same a lot of uh funny enough in the beginning a lot of people would say just have sex and then the penis pushes it the prolapse back up into place okay haha that's amazing but it doesn't quite work that way (laughs) no no and, um, and so thankfully, I, know, I, I just wanted to touch on that and I didn't want, as, I, as you said, I did, certainly did not want to invade your privacy or your husband's privacy because it's a yeah. big deal. But I just wanted our listeners to be aware sure. because they're probably thinking it. Um, but it does. It absolutely impacts women who, who go through prolapse. Yeah, and I think luckily enough for now, having toddlers like two under two, the sheer tiredness of being parents of two under two it kind of lets you sail under the radar for a while because <laughs> you're yeah. really tired and you've got no energy. No one's got energy. But now they're four and six, things are changing. And I know that that, wouldn't, that level of inti- intimacy will need to be addressed better than it has been. And for those who really want to know, for me to be able to do that, I got really drunk at my daughter's first birthday. And right. so just being able to relax and that's taking yeah. the pressure off because it doesn't, sometimes it hurts, some, but then we don't continue. Um, it's uncomfortable. doesn't feel the same for either of us. And so, yeah, it's not something that, it's definitely something that has been taken away in that yeah. birthing suite for yeah. sure. Um, so um, in terms of surgery for you, and so let's go down that path and, and where things are at right now. Yeah, so, we, so I had, went and had the second baby and it was amazing. And I do want to say I went and found that obstetrician who helped me and I tracked him down and he did open a private practice and I said, I have, 
I need you to help me birth this baby because I have to have a cesarean this time. Like I couldn't return to the place where the trauma happened. And he was the person that convinced me, well, educated me. He didn't convince me. It was my decision that I actually didn't need a cesarean, that having a cesarean could potentially have some impact on further surgery. Right. So if I was going to have the prolapse surgery and having a cesarean, there may be scar tissue. So he educated me on that because the surgery was always at the um, the light. Let's just say it was always the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I did have a second vaginal birth with a lot of hand holding. He held that space for me. And pain relief, I hope. Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, good Lord, woman. <laughs> I had, sorry, I had gas. Yes. No, that Thank is pain. You. That is pain. <laughs> that is pain relief. It's just that it came... He came quicker than expected. Yes, that's that's yes. why. It wasn't that I was trying to be brave and tough and get a medal. He just came too quick for it. Well, for I'm anything. glad you at least had some gas. <laughs> <laughs> and he was little. He was so tiny. Yeah. It was that healing birth experience. Yeah. And I think a lot of women uh, with birth trauma hopefully can be blessed with, right? Yep. That's their choice to have a second birth. Um so then I went back pretty much, I had I had Louis in the July and I was back in January to the surgeon going, right, I'm here, let's do it. Let's do this thing, yeah. Let me get back to some type of stuff where I can take my kids for a walk, where I can play in the park with them, where I can cook their dinner without being in pain. Just really simple shit that I thought. Where you can <laughs> sit down properly. <laughs> So um, he said, okay, so we went and did this process. Uh, it was called neurodynamics testing where they do a whole lot of tests pre-surgery. And at the end of that appointment, I think that went for about two hours again, and he says to me, hmm, Steph, I'm really sorry to tell you, you're not a candidate for this surgery. If I do this for you, you've got a 90% failure rate within two years. And I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm up for that. Like that, those stats are not in my favour at all. And it also would have meant a uh, partial hysterectomy and then going through menopause at 40. Uh, sorry, how old was it? 30, 38 or something. I was like, oh, can I come back to you when you've got better stats? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, you have to. Like I, I, I'm pretty sure he said you could go and look for someone else. But I knew at that point that he was the leading person that other people look up to because I went to go and see someone else for, um, she was an obstetrician gynecologist and she said, oh, look, I can't help you, but you need to go see this guy. I'm like, I already see that guy. She's like, oh, geez, <laughs> there's not much more you can do wow, here. Wow, okay, yeah. There's really, yeah. there's really not much more you can do here in Australia. Your next thing will be overseas if you were game enough to do any type of guinea pig stuff over there. So here we are, you know, my daughter's six and quite funnily after writing the book and starting the community, people have this conception that I was able to fix my prolapse. Like, well, you're healed, you're fixed. I'm like, no, I still no, live with it every day. <laughs> you live with it every day. And the really fascinating thing, you know, if people read the book, they will know that it's an ongoing journey for you to live with this trauma until someone can come up with something, um, as you say, with better stats, until there are new surgical procedures that over time develop for women who um, who are going through your particular type of trauma. Because as you say, you know, it's not easy to attach, you know, tissue and muscle back to bone. It just doesn't, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, yeah. yeah. And Oh, sorry, I was going to say, do you mind if I just jump in there as well? Because oh, of a course. lot of people will say, oh, women have had this type of surgery with mesh. So they used to use mesh and mm. that, that was acting as the attachment to the bone. However, that's been banned since 2015. Um, it's fascinating that you bring that up because we had an amazing guest on this podcast named Erin Guest. And Erin actually is a survivor of, um, not of the mesh, but she was a survivor of um, a, a, a medical device uh, called the eShore, um, which at the same time as the mesh was banned and both of those products are part of an extraordinary um, Netflix documentary series. I don't know if anyone's seen doc Doco Movie. Um, uh, I'll put the link down below so people awesome. can read that as well. It's quite fascinating. Okay. You're right. So mesh has been banned. It, it has caused 
no, you know, lifelong trauma for the women that have undergone that mesh surgery um, because essentially it cannot be removed once it's put in and your tissue grows over it and it's caused massive pain, trauma. Chronic, like trauma Chronic. on top of trauma. And look, I do know of some women who have had mesh many years ago and it's been really successful and that's amazing for them. But then for the others where it's been really damaging, it's really hard. And it's huge. There are support groups all around the world, uh, as we learned through through the, you know the beautiful bravery and courage of Erin, who came on and shared her story about that. Yeah. Um, and yes, there are. So I mean, people can just look it up, really. Uh, and as I said, I'll put some links. I'll write myself a note to do that in the show notes because people might be thinking, oh, but someone, you know, I've heard of that. Yeah. That's um, right. And thank you for jumping in and expressing that. I I think when something has been you know that damaging, it then does not become an option. And as you say, thankfully, it took a long time for it to be banned everywhere in the world, uh, including Australia. So, And Thank for you. any women out there listening who have had that done and are suffering, you know, we see you and acknowledge you because it's, it's a, a lifelong um, journey to, to, to basically live with pain and suffering. When all they were trying to do was fix their prolapse. Correct. Correct. It's, uh, it's, and that in and of itself is, that's a whole other podcast because it's so traumatizing, you know, for so many women. I'm glad you raised that though, because it's really important. So when people say, why don't you just go and get it fixed? Um, For some women, there is no easy fix just like yourself um, and you've gone down every path and you've, you've basically exhausted everything in Australia at least. I think I'm pretty sure I have. I don't feel like I've left any stone unturned, but if anyone's listening, and they think, well, this might be possible, just message me. I'm, o- I'm <laughs> open ears and open heart to anything. Nothing's a- too... Absolutely. Yeah. Reach out. But this leads me to your next project. So first of all, before I just jump out of the book, because it's so extraordinary, and I love that you went to Bali to go to a writing retreat, r- retreat uh, <laughs> with Andy Griffith, and that you end up coming back and going, oh, wow, well, you know, I've written this book which is cathartic, but also that you needed and you knew you needed to put out into the world. So thank you for doing that. So many women will be grateful. Um, So in launching the book, what I wanted to know was what was the response from family, which is this is important, from family, from your close friends, and also for the community that you have built out there um, under your Brave Mama um, banner? Yeah, I think uh, initially my family were shocked and heartbroken because they didn't understand what was happening for us. They knew that something was off, I mean, for years, but just didn't really know. So, uh, you know, here's a perfect example. As a trauma response, which I didn't recognize at the beginning, when Elsie was born, I was hypervigilant and I didn't want anyone touching her at all. Not my husband. And what is it when you have a baby? Everyone wants a cuddle. And my mum went to feed her one day and she had the bottle and she kind of put her hand on the cheek And I was like, don't touch her. Don't touch her face. And at the time, I thought it was really logical to say that to mum. Like, don't make her germy. But now in retrospect, you realise, that would have scared the shit out of my mum to say, why can't she touch her face? But so they they learnt a lot. And then then it was a question of, well, why didn't you tell us? And I said, well, because I didn't have the words to say something that I did not understand myself and only through writing did I write it and I I used to um do this thing I don't know if all writers do this but I did this because I wrote every morning at 4 a.m for one hour consistently every day but just to make sure I was on track I would listen to the paragraph I wrote wrote before on you know, on the Word document, you can do a voice thing. Yes, And yes. it reads it back to you in a very robotic voice. But I remember listening the first time before I submitted it to the publisher and I listened to the entire thing. And then I sat back in my chair and I was like, oh, that poor girl. Holy moly, that's horrible. And then I went, oh, shit, that's me actually. That 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 is me. And that, that was like a major light bulb moment to go, I haven't said any of this to anyone and I had an amazing group of five mums in our mother's group and they came to the launch and they've always been a beautiful bunch of friends but they were like we're 
we're so sorry we couldn't support you better. I'm like, we didn't know. We didn't know. I didn't know. I yeah. didn't know. I just thought I had to pretend to be mum and, and happy and because they saw me for maybe an hour a week. But to get myself to that hour, the preparation involved and parking the car and doing all of that, all that really heavy thinking about how am I, what am I going to wear so the prolapse isn't worse and how can I park myself on the ground so that I don't have to get up and walk around? All of that stuff. And they were just sad. They were sad that, um, that they couldn't help. And then I felt really guilty. I was like, oh, God, no, what have I done? <laughs> as, as if you hadn't been through enough, now you feel guilty. <laughs> no, but, I mean, I hope that you've been able to let go of some of that guilt by sharing this and putting this out into the world because in doing so what you are doing is – not only helping your friends and family to understand what you survived and lived through and your husband as well, yeah. but it you're helping other women and building a community for women who are living through birth trauma. And that's, that's a, an extraordinary thing that you've achieved. Well, I think, thank you for saying that. That's really kind. I, a couple of things there is that a really nice thing when I got back from Bali and this had all kind of happened, my husband one day said to me, he said, you took that girl to Bali and you brought my wife back. Oh, that's so emotional. I can see that still makes you emotional too. It is that's, because. That's, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing for him to say. Because I know? couldn't tell him why I had to go to Bali, but he told me in that, that one line, it's like, yeah, I knew I had to go. I couldn't explain it, but yeah, sorry, God, I am emotional. <laughs> hey, it happens a lot here in the confessional <laughs> But I also think that I, I put this book out thinking that I could change the world, Sandy, for people who haven't had a baby yet. And then I soon realised that the book is probably targeted more for women who are like me, who have been through birth, birth trauma, to feel seen and heard. But then I also think it's written for the people charged caring for us, our midwives, our obstetricians, our GPs. Everyone in the medical field should read it. But then I also think... And I think I've been helped along the way by talking about to other women that we need to really be talking about this before women are pregnant. Because if I honestly have to reflect, if my pregnant self, if someone gave me that book, I probably would tell them where to shove it because <laughs> I'm not having trauma because I was so hell bent that my birth was going to be perfect and beautiful. So I think that maybe beforehand, Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's really interesting. I think uh, if the more we talk about this stuff in society, the more normalised it would become. And then the more women would understand this prior to even, you know, going out into their birth journey. Yes. Um, you know, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I think for people like myself, and I think I my birth trauma was completely different. I did not have a prolapse. Um, but in reading your book, um, really, as I said, I wish that I had something like, I, I wish I'd read your story when I <laughs> had given birth to my child. So in my case, I was 21. I was fearless. I was a very young mum, almost 22. And, uh, and I, you know, when my water broke, the first thing that I did was go and put on makeup. And uh, because I was going to go to the hospital, and it was going to be fabulous. And I was going to give birth to this baby. And it was, you know, the choir would sing and the totally. angels would come down from heaven and it was just going to be easy and brilliant. Um, and when I walked into the hospital, I remember the midwives, like all sort of having a look, they looked at each other and kind of oh. one of them chuckled. Like I think they thought, bless, here she is with her makeup on and she's got no idea what's coming. Um, and I, and of course I didn't really have any idea what was coming. It was a, it was a, a, a 12 hour labor, I was, uh, my contractions were very close together and I was fairly dilated very early on. Uh, my baby's head crowned and it was another six hours with that baby's head crowning and they could not get him out. Um, and at which point, uh, and at some point during this, uh, a gyne I, I had an obstetrician and she had come in. But I think she thought, oh, this will just be an easy one. And so there were midwives there and they were brilliant. And, in fact, I credit those midwives yeah. to saving my life. Um, they knew pretty early on that something was wrong and there was huge fights over the top of me, by the way, between the midwives, two midwives and this obstetrician who was a woman. Uh, and I kept saying, I'm in so much pain, I'm in so much pain. And she said, oh, don't be ridiculous. You're not the only woman. You're not the first woman who's had a baby. I 
right? So this, now my child is now 30. I am to this day extraordinarily grateful that he's here. But what happened during the course of that was the obstetrician at some point thought this is not working and decided to push him back up (gasps) into the birth canal. I have since spoken to many women where this has happened as well, but for a long time I thought this was, I was the only person in the world. Um, Unfortunately, what happened was I went into what they call obstetric shock. My heart stopped. I flatlined and I was gone. Um, Oh, Sandy. So at that point, though, the gynecologist, another, sorry, a paediatrician was called. One of the midwives called a paediatrician before my heart stopped. She overrode the gun. So that's where the fighting was coming from. He walked in. He's like listening to the, he's saying, we're losing. I heard him actually say, we're losing this baby. Mm. And I, I remember my partner, and my mother were in the room. They got ushered out. So they knew all how it was about to break loose. Yeah. And there was this beautiful um, anaesthetist who was called in by the paediatrician, called him down. Um, and he came in and he, I remember I was laying down. He was standing at my head and he was stroking my hair. And he was South American and he was saying to me with this beautiful accent, um, everything's going to be all right, everything's going to be all right. Oh. And and I don't remember this, but he came to see me after everything had happened that he said, I looked back at him and said, I, I'll die but just let my ba- get my baby out, let my baby live. And he was South American and incredibly religious and he said for him it was a, a very, it was like a religious moment, a spiritual moment of you know, that I would give up my life for my son. And so um, I was not religious at all, so it didn't come from that place. And then um, through all of this, yes, so my heart stopped. Thank God that anaesthetist literally dove over. He was actually doing CPR um, and they knew they had to get the baby out because they couldn't do anything for me until they did. So I have a Caesar scar. This is why I don't tell this story to, you know, expectant mothers. I have a Caesar scar that goes from hip to hip. I, I, no anesthetic, nothing. There was no time. My heart had stopped. So they just sliced and diced. They got that baby literally. out, literally, and then they zapped me back and uh, and brought me back. But his, my baby's heartbeat was dropping dramatically, and they thought, you know, he was in trauma. I was gone. Um, so in, they brought me back as well. And I, and to this day, sometimes even when <laughs> this is a really funny story, but even when I have a really hot shower, I still get these purple marks. I can just oh, see the from the pads. From the paddles, yeah. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> and that lasted. They, they they used to be really purple every time I had a shower for many years. I mean, they're very faint now. Um, but they brought this baby back. And I remember um, after all of the trauma, you know, of coming back, and obviously I was in ICU and I don't – it was all a bit fuzzy. But the yeah. first time I sort of remember coming to, everything was white. I'm in this room, curtain, whatever. I don't know. And I'm drugged up. I honestly thought I had gone to heaven. Oh. Well, of course, because that's what they do in the movies. They let right. you go and then it's, oh, then you're everything's in white. I am. And uh, clearly it was the drugs. Apparently adrenaline will do this to you too because okay. they pump you full of adrenaline. Um, and h- hilariously I was like, oh, because I'm so not religious, I was like, wow, it exists. There's a heaven. I'm here. Oh, wow. Okay. And then And then a nurse came in who I don't know who I thought she was in heaven, but I said, oh, my baby, can I just see my baby once? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll bring him. I unwrapped this baby. He was fat and he had wings and he was beautiful. And then I was telling, you know, saying to the nurse, but he had this huge mark on his head and that was they'd use forceps trying to get him out oh, early on. Yeah. And he was, yeah, had a massive kind of bruise right up his head. And they said, and I said to her, "Oh, look at him! I've given. He's a, he's a, he's a, an angel. Like he's a got cherub. wings. Look at him! He's got wings." And she was looking at me, bless her. And I remember she <laughs> sort of she took the baby off me, and she said, <laughs> "Darling, can you hear yourself?" And I said, "Yes, he's be oh, he's beautiful." And she said, "Can you hear yourself? I just want you to think for a minute." And then it kind of slowly sinks in that you're going, "Oh my god!" And I was like. Oh, and then I think I blacked out again. The yeah. next time I saw my baby and I was really with it was this skinny, screaming, oh. normal baby yeah. with no wings. And I said to her, this is not my baby because my baby's got wings. <laughs> oh, Sandy. Bless. Anyway, oh my incredible. God. And 
but I think like years later and being so young trying to fathom that and I don't think I carried that birth trauma around with me I didn't realize sorry that I did carry that birth trauma until as I say I was pregnant many years later by this stage I'm divorced remarried and uh, you know and I'm pregnant with my my new husband at that time and thinking the whole way through oh god I'm gonna face that again this is gonna happen of course strangely I did go to my new gynecologist obstetrician and I said to her do you think I could do a trial labor and she looked at me and said there is not a hope in hell and you know I'm happy to refer you to as many uh, obstetricians as you want but no one's going to touch you with a barge pole it's a Caesar it's never going to happen and I would of course arm myself with knowledge and education and I trusted her incredibly this new um, obstetrician and she was right there was no way but there you go but in reading your book I you know I think there's so many different kinds of trauma yours is such an extraordinary story but it allows other women the space to talk about their trauma and I have spoken about mine before and I'm actually fine now at 52. Um, I I can still see it in you though Sandy I don't think it ever leaves you does it? it, I don't think it could ever go away and I actually think you know you carry that fear I certainly did through the next two pregnancies Mm -hmm. and I'm just so grateful they are all here my Mm -hmm. son likes to joke to, to his siblings that he is like a Jesus baby. He is a um, bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I do think, I think I, I, it's something that will never go away. You learn to, to understand it yeah. and you learn, you educate Process. yourself medically, all the things of yeah. what happened, how could that possibly happen? Yeah. Um, but I, you're right, I don't think it ever, ever goes away. And so in you writing this beautiful book, if you've given women a voice and a space to feel safe i hope so because do you know what i do wish and i did i just jump in too soon there because no, you, you, i do wish that i had the knowledge and power to advocate for myself because that's what we have to do to say okay we're here at this position now we've been here for 18 hours i think i'd like a cesarean please so there's two things we have to do we have to unpeel the layer of shame um the natural birth advocacy can carry that cesarean is you know when you read things like on instagram and they say oh shocking alarming cesarean rates are going up to 36 percent and i say who gives a shit the people that give a shit are the people who are paying for them and let's be honest this government policy that was brought out called towards normal birth pushed my hospital to make me push that baby out because it was cheaper than having a cesarean The next layer of that is that natural birth advocates honestly do believe that vaginal birth is better. They will give you all the stats and reasons why a cesarean is not good for a baby. And they could end up with asthma and eczema and blah de blah de blah. And when you're thrown these stats in your face, you think that you're making a choice for that natural birth is better because that's what you're being sold. I wish we could eliminate all of that and look at each woman as an individual rather than a statistic because every time you stat me you take the human element out of my story every time you tell me that my birth trauma is not as common or whatever you're forgetting stephanie the person and that that needs to change i thought the book would do all of that magically like da-da, i fixed childbirth and you're like oh god it's nothing it's a drop in the ocean because we've got centuries of beliefs, feelings, core structural thought processes that one little me cannot change alone. And no, but what you have done is created, as I said, you've, you're starting to create this community through the, you know, the Brave Mamas Fight, which is brilliant. Um, and the book, I think, will help women who have lived through birth trauma not feel so alone. I hope. Um, I, and I do believe that you're doing that, Stephanie. So, Thank you. Um, and I think you're right. It's a systematic thing. I'm really sad that having a child 30 years ago, despite the fact that my heart stopped, having a Caesar was looked upon. And I remember going to this mother's group where they were all older than me and they all had natural births. And the way that they, one particular woman who clicked her tongue at me, <gasps> and I never went back. So I missed out on the support of a mother's group. I because I felt really um, I felt they were really condescending Judged. in that 
She judged I felt you. So judged, and I felt like I was young and stupid, as if I had any any control over the birth of that child. Um, and for the other two, I started really, I think, speaking out. Um, with the other two when I had to have a Caesar and I would read in these like mother's groups and mother's forums and whatever so many bitchy comments about women who took the easy way out and had a Caesar you know and it was first of all it's you know a grieving thing for any woman who thinks they're going to have a natural birth as I did as a lot of women do um, who don't have that opportunity um but also for some women, and my obstetrician, and this is a really important point, my brilliant obstetrician, she said to me 100 years ago, 50 years ago from when I had my birth, she says, 50 years ago, you would have been one of those women who just died in childbirth. Done. You and your baby wouldn't even be here. She said, thank God for medical you know, um, technology. Thank God that we now know different things. There is no reason, as she said to me even back then, there is no reason for any woman to have to um, go through natural childbirth without any pain relief. She said, you know, that's ridiculous to even think that. Um, She said, and for a lot of women, natural childbirth is not actually an option or it shouldn't be an option. And as she said to me, the biggest outcome, and this is my gynecologist who, who, you know, I had for my two my two later babies um and she just said to me at the end of the day what is the most important thing here it isn't it it is actually having a healthy baby yeah and deliver and a healthy mum. let's say that and a healthy Healthy and a healthy mother together if that's what people want us to journey into motherhood then let's make it uh, as safe and as possible and as happy for everyone involved whatever that pathway looks like i just think this the the pitting of the vaginal versus cesarean, it's going to be ongoing unless, like you said, we start talking about it openly and that starts from a really young age when we talk about with our young girls, even about their pelvic floor, you know, and, and we don't have to talk about, we don't have to talk about anything sexual in high school or birth or, you know, and we're not going to prepare no, we them. should be. By the time high school happening, I really think we should be talking about that stuff. It should not be this, you know, 16, 17 year old girls, 15 year old girls are highly capable, I think, of hearing this information and not, and seeing it as, okay, this is a natural thing. If I choose to have a child, um, I need to understand my body and I need to understand. That's the other thing. We're not really understanding our own bodies and we're being taught that getting pregnant, having a baby is the most natural thing in the world. It's like Um, the rite of passage. But I do do also think that when I initially started, yes, I was working in this birth trauma space, there are organisations and other individuals who are doing that and have done it for longer than me which is why I probably wanted to move into something more like the pelvic organ prolapse because I feel like it can have a bigger impact there. When I think about my daughter, I can't ever really control her birth. No matter how much preparation I do for her and talk to her and educate her and talk to her, what happens in her birth will happen. But I can teach her more about her pelvic floor and pelvic organ prolapse as a child you know, no straining when you poo, no, not eating too much junk food, drinking lots of water so your poos come out in the lead up to if she chooses to ever fall pregnant. So that I felt like I moved a little bit away from the trauma itself because it's hard to stay in that trauma space as well, I will say, to the things that I can have a bigger impact on, which is why I know you probably want to talk a little bit about the podcast, which is why I continued because to change the spectrum of not just childbirth, but a woman with a pelvic floor, because now we've got one in two women with pelvic floor dysfunction, which is way more than birth trauma. I think we've got a better chance at helping women at a very early age and then potentially once they are ready to birth, they already are a little bit more ahead of the game. Yes, absolutely. I I 100,000% agree (laughs) with that. But also too that I do think that it there should be a space when we're ta- we're learning about uh, getting pregnant when we're learning about birth when we're learning about all of those things that we should actually have like a little caveat that for you know some women these are the risks that can happen 
Right. For all women, there's a risk. There is absolutely a risk. Um, but if we're, as you say, if we're armed with knowledge, knowledge is power. And it might actually change the way some women view their birthing experience to take pressure off some women who are being told it, this does not look at, like, it's not looking like you're going to have a vaginal birth and for them to go, okay, then I'm all right with that. I do know things are changing. I have got friends who, um, you know, from the onset, as soon as they were pregnant said, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go with the flow. You know, I hope to have a, a vaginal birth, but if I don't, so be it. I just want this baby. That's it. I think that's a beautiful way to actually view pregnancy and to not put this extraordinary pressure on ourselves as women that we are somehow achieving greatness if we have a vaginal birth or failing if we have a Caesar. Yeah, it, it's ridiculous. Definitely. But it is part of a patriarchal and societal thing of pitting women against each other regardless of what it may be. And now even birthing isn't a safe space for us. Um, as I said, 30 years ago I was very judged for, and my other children, are, one's about to turn 24 and my baby's 21, um, there was still like quite a bit of that bullshit going on that yeah. if you've had, had a Caesar you somehow opted out. Um, I'm so sorry I'm that sad happened to, to you. Hear that 20, 21 years later, people are still doing that shit. I mean, we need to cut that nonsense out. And as women really support each other, especially in these extraordinary spaces like childbirth, like pregnancy, where we should be supporting one another and, and, uh, and helping each other. We could do a whole other show on this. But even, oh, we could. Even <laughs> when you get to breastfeeding, and you know, like I was, I, I will, I will sadly admit now that my um, ignorance, I guess, uh, when I went to mother's group and one of this, one was bottle feeding, the rest were breastfeeding. I passed judgment in my mind. I never said anything out loud, but in my mind, I'm like, Oh, why isn't she breastfeeding? Oh yeah. That's a whole other, we could do like you know? two podcasts on breastfeeding yeah. and the judgment agreed. But sometimes you don't realize you're doing it until you've done it. And then I was like, Oh, hang on a minute. And then she told me why. And I was like, Oh God, I shouldn't have thought that. Why did I even think that? But it's ingrained. And who cares? Yes. And, you know, yes. and as women, what we need to do is empower women to have choices. If you choose to have a Caesar for whatever reason, and you are talking about that with your obstetrician, or gynecologists, we never know what's going on with other people. And I think it's, yeah. it's yeah, we've got to stop the sort of judging. I know that it's so ingrained yeah. in society, um, but the more we can stop judging each other as women, the more support we can give each other, which leads me to your beautiful new project. So congratulations <laughs> on your podcast, which launched in September. Is that right? Women's Health Week, right? Smack bang in Women's Health Week. I don't think Ooh. you could have picked a better week for it, I think. <laughs> Um, I'm loving it. And um, so the name of your podcast is? The Lowdown with Brave Mama. So we give the lowdown. We really really just open up those conversations that you kind of, um, you know, when you meet someone for the first time and it's like, hi, how are you? Yeah, good. How are you? And then after the 10th time, you really start to talk openly and honestly, oh, my God, I can't breastfeed either. I really freaking hate it. I don't want to do it, but I feel, pre you know, those type of conversations where you just go the to The important that, conversations. Yeah, the next level, kind of when, I guess what we were just saying, the judgment falls away that I feel like I can open up and say to you, I hated breastfeeding without thinking that you were going to judge me. So we are having those conversations with women where they can, they can be themselves, um, no judgment, and hopefully I think that's going to help so many women oh I know it does because they tell me like we get private messages all the time saying I feel like I'm not the only one going through this now I love that and as you say with your podcast it's like you know um, it's periods to pregnancy and motherhood to menopause motherhood to menopause <laughs> Preach it, sister, because I think the the more more women uh, like your good self uh, who are out there openly discussing all of these things, the better it is for all of us. Um, I wish, as I said, that uh, these conversations had been happening 30-odd years ago when I was pregnant with my child and I, you know, podcasts were not even a thing yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think it's really important and that's what we, we aspire to do in this podcast, as, you know, just like as you do in yours, is to Love have it. open conversations about the issues that impact women uh, that we are not alone and that there's always somewhere out someone out there who possibly has has gone through a similar experience 
we know that even if you have an, you know what what appears on paper to be an identical experience it's never identical that yeah, each of our true. journeys is so individual but it does help to know that you're not alone yeah it really does because i not only have i put this out to try and create a community but just as much sandy they give me community i feel seen and heard within my group and i love that it feels like i belong somewhere really belong somewhere by just being me it's so good yeah. And that's one of the most powerful things that you can do. I think, you know, um, I recently put up a, a quote, I think, on one of our sites uh, from a, Michelle Obama who talks about, you know, the difference between a healthy society, and this is not what she said verbatim, by the way. That's Let me great. paraphrase. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the difference between a healthy society and a broken society um, a healthy society is one in where women feel seen, heard, and respected because that's community and and I you know that so resonates with everything that I do I yeah. love what you were doing there are so many amazing women I know that birth trauma is getting talked about slowly by amazing people I know that Clementine Ford has talked about birth trauma and how this has been overlooked um, by a lot of women I think any woman who has a platform um, you know can help to talk about women's issues and the many things that happen to us biologically that weirdly we're supposed to feel ashamed about and yet we cannot control. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing that the work that you're doing and the work that we're doing in Clementine and everyone else who is doing something, and obviously we can't name them all because there's quite a few now. There's so many, yes. Wouldn't it be amazing that one day it put us out of a job because we did such a good job? Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, I, I, I feel like I feel like for me, I'll be really lucky. I could do this until the day I die because there will always be women who do, uh, you know, who just have amazing stories. Um, but you're right. In terms of equality for women, you know, one of the places that we're still fighting for equality and to be heard is in the medical arena uh, for so many women. And in my, uh, you know, age demographic, it's menopause. Yep, exactly. Uh, for a lot of women not being heard, not being believed, not being taken seriously with what they are going through. Menopause is a very different journey for every woman. Um, and for women having to desperately Google and find information themselves about what is happening to their bodies is insane. It is insane. Um, Right, so there's, you know, you've got all that to look forward to. Yay. It's, um, <laughs> it's here. It's knocking at my door, don't oh, you it's worry. Oh, it's knocking at your door, it's yeah. Peri, it's Perry knocking at my door. <laughs> well, I'm still perimenopausal. And, and here's another thing that women don't realise, and for younger listeners who are listening to this, um, that perimenopause is not something that you get and it lasts like a year and then you're suddenly in menopause. Perimenopause can actually last 15 years. And it's different for every woman. I know the textbooks will tell you it's like maybe two to five years. That's what I thought. For some, for some women it can last. And so my beautiful doctor has said to me, no, some women are perimenopausal for 15-odd years. Awesome. Yay. Woo. What she does say, though, is that no woman should need to suffer through menopause needlessly either. That's a whole other podcast. Let's um, do it. <laughs> but I think the big thing for all women and one of the things that I know that you are proactive about is that Never be afraid as a woman to go get a second opinion. Third, um, fourth, fifth. Third, fourth, whatever it may take. Yep. Um, never be afraid to keep reading about new things that are happening um, in science and in the medical realm. Yep. Um, and if you, you're not being taken seriously by your GP, go find a new one. Easy. Just like that. You just go, I love you, but you're not my jam. See I'm you moving, later. I'm moving on. <laughs> you're not understanding me. And, you know, some GPs are brilliant for your everyday stuff, which is what they are trained to do. Yep. You know, if you've got the flu, if you, you know, you might have cut your arm, yeah. you might need some stitches. Brilliant, right? But uh, some GPs are not well-versed in female issues, um, in birthing issues, in whatever it may be so go find yourself a new one who'll take you seriously and we'll send you on to see specialists if you need it and that's part of our next plan sandy is that all of this stuff as a collective is that we build better health literacy so that i want to target universities so even in women's health fitness space anyone who is involved in caring for a woman is better armed instead of a one-hour lecture there's a lot, of, a lot of work to do. I feel like I've got my life's work ahead of me too. And that's really exciting. I actually really love it. It is exciting. Um, I will put, we have spoken for so long now. Uh, <laughs> um, How good is it? 
It's brilliant, and I could talk all day. If I had, if I had the time, we would be just kept. We just kept talking. Um, I am going to put all of your links below so people can follow you. Perfect. So where they can find your book, where they can find your website, where they can sure. listen to your brilliant podcast. Thank you. It's really exciting, and I just love that you are in this space advocating for other women. Thank you for the, your generosity today, your very kind words and your time. Yes, I do see that we've been an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and that's fine. I think, you know, it's such an important subject. I'm sure down the track we'll be having you on again, hearing about all the amazing other things that are yet to come, as you say. I do think that a million women um, out there will be grateful for better literacy. Um, yeah in our healthcare system. Likewise, Sandy, I'm going to ask, put you on the spot. I really want you on the show. I really want you to come and talk to us on the lowdown with Brave Mama because you two are a very brave mama. Thank you. And I would absolutely be honoured to uh, (laughs) to share the space on your podcast. I think it's really needed and brilliant. Uh, I know there's so many women out there finally finding a voice in different areas um, and speaking out. And for all of us, that can only be a good thing. Love it. Love it. Come back for season two next year for sure. Yay. Can't wait. (laughs) Uh, It's just been brilliant talking to you. As I said, I will put up all the links for Stephanie's site and her book and, uh, and her podcast. Please do follow her journey. And, you know, I hope this has been really helpful for any woman out there who's, who has gone through birth trauma, who is surviving birth trauma and feeling, um, I hope not so alone through this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thanks for listening to the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is brought to you by WB40, Women Beyond 40 magazine. Available now at wb40.com. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to quality podcasts. We're also now available on YouTube. We chat with really interesting women about their hard-won wisdom, but it really helps us if you can subscribe, like, and share the podcast. Thanks so much for your support. Bye for now.
Thanks for listening to the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is brought to you by WB40, Women Beyond 40 magazine. Available now at wb40.com. The Good Girl Confessional Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to quality podcasts. We're also now available on YouTube. We chat with really interesting women about their hard-won wisdom, but it really helps us if you can subscribe, like, and share the podcast. Thanks so much for your support. Bye for now.